This video is about my 7 most underrated videos, namely those videos which I think provided great information yet only received lackluster views. As such, I will mention shortly each video, explain why I think you should watch it and show you a short clip. Now if you want, you can also post your own pic in the comment section as well. Note the video should have less than 200,000 views. Anyway, let's get started. At number 7, with around 170,000 views, why the Mongols were so effective. This video comes with 20 minutes of information that required more than 34 hours to produce. For this, I looked at the sources about their nomadic lifestyle, logistics, training, organization, tactics, administration and other aspects as well. And here is the selected clip. To summarize, the Mongols were able to conquer an empire that reached from Korea to Hungary due to their military and political capabilities. Many of these seem to have been derived from the experiences and habits of living as nomads in the steppe. As such, pragmatism, mobility and flexibility were key principles they followed out of necessity. As nomads, they had to move regularly the large herds of different animals, which required careful planning due to the requirements of the diverse herds and the limits of the terrain. As such, they had a keen talent for logistics. Additionally, the nature of the nomadic society on the steppe was such that to speak of the Mongol army is really no more than to speak of the Mongol people in one of its natural aspects. For the whole of life was a process of military training. The same techniques that were necessary for survival in a herding and hunting environment were with very little adaptation those used in warfare. The life in the steppe was harsh and errors would have dire consequences not only for the individual but also for the herd and as such the whole community. This might explain the extensive focus on discipline. Now let us move a bit further east. At number 6, the Japanese tank arm, with just 70,000 views. In this video I looked at the origins of the Japanese armored forces, their units and tanks. Additionally I discussed various contradictions in current literature. It also comes with some footage of one of the last running Type 95 Hago tanks as well. It had a weight of 7 tons and was armed with a 37mm gun and two machine guns. The crew consisted of a commander, driver and hull machine gun. As such, the commander acted also as a gunner. Since it was equipped with the same diesel engine as the Type 89B but had considerable less weight, it had far better mobility. A prototype was sent to the Independent Mixed Brigade and based upon these experiences, a second prototype was constructed in 1935. One major difference to the prototype was the second machine gun, which was located in the rear part of the turret. So much for the Hago. Let's look at one of the most significant battles in Northeast Asia before the outbreak of the Asia-Pacific War. At number 5 with 90,000 views is What Makes a Sniper. For this video I looked at several books in the US Army Field Manual on the various qualifications and requirements. The latter had three major categories, namely physical, mental and acquired skills, since they often deployed independently for longer durations. Thus two important qualifications are required, emotional balance and fieldcraft. The first emotional balance, which is well quite interestingly described. Emotional balance, the sniper must be able to calmly and deliberately kill targets that may not pose immediate threat to him. It is much easier to kill in self-defense or in defense of others than it is to kill without apparent provocation. So keep that in mind the next time you tell someone that you think that they are an emotional balanced person. Additionally, it is stated that anxiety, remorse and similar emotions are no-go as well. The sniper should be capable of cold rationality. Compared to emotional balance, Feecraft feels rather benign and is also outlined without specific details. The potential sniper should be familiar and comfortable in a field environment. Thus he should have an extensive background in outdoors and natural environments, since this will support him in his tasks. At number 4 with 80,000 views is why land lease is so complicated. In this I take a very short look considering how insanely complex the topic is at the various factors that make land lease such a difficult topic, even if one leaves out the politics. After this video you should understand why just looking at the numbers is highly misleading since there are so many aspects to consider like quality, production efficiency due to global cooperation and of course also timing. On a larger scale, the author Mark Harrison suggests that the collapse of Soviet economy was not unlikely. 
The history of other wars and other countries suggests that the Soviet economy should have collapsed in 1942. He explains that due to the total mobilization and severe losses in man and material, there was a shortage of various resources and machinery. Additionally, workers needed to be fed and clothed and competed for the same means of subsistence as the soldiers on the front line and the farmers in the rear. As war production climbed, the civilian infrastructure fell away. It is certain that land lease provided a stabilizing effect, yet how crucial it was is hard to determine. We cannot measure the distance of Soviet economy from the point of collapse in 1942, but it seems beyond doubt the collapse was near. Without land lease, it would have been nearer. Now, it is also important to quote some notable experts here that think that land lease was of little to no importance in the early years. At number 3 with 80,000 views, some alternate history, which I'm not a particularly fan of in general. Since most alternate history is like a tan, it is superficial, but too much might still give you cancer. In my opinion, to do alternate history properly, you need at least 2 to 100 times the amount of research than for a regular history topic. After all, you need to take into account all the stuff that didn't happen, or was only a minor footnote in history. It requires an extensive understanding of the time and actors involved. To even scratch the surface of our topic, military aviation history, Dach and Niflen, and I did quite some digging. Nevertheless, for our limited scenario, we still had to ignore the whole political dimension. Still, the video is almost one hour long. Here is a short clip featuring Dach and Niflen. When Rommel historically got very close to breaking the British, and that's when the British had a lot more forces available and a lot more secure supply lines, there were periods in that in, during those offensives where the British were like, well, one more bad battle and we've got nothing between here and Alexandria. We'd, have, we'd make a final stand at, on the Nile and then we're stuffed. So if you've got significantly more ground forces in there, you could make a, a fairly decent argument say, well, actually, if you can build up enough supplies to sustain one big push and just throw everything into it, even, even Luftwaffe transport aircraft if necessary to bring up the most vital supplies, uh, the sort of the, the low volume, high importance stuff. If you can shatter the desert army in the western reaches of Egypt, they don't have anywhere to go. The sort of western Egypt's like, well, this just open baked desert. There's nowhere really that makes a good defensive position until you've, you've fallen back to the Nile. And once they've fallen back there, you could operationally pause a little bit, build up enough supplies just to make it across, and then you arrive in overwhelming numbers. There's not a lot the British can do other than they could probably hold Alexandria for a while, probably mainly on the basis of naval gunfire support, which probably won't do good things to panzers. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but, but by that point, it would just be a case of, well, how long does it take to bring the Luftwaffe up to, also, a, yeah. to, to the point we could start carpet bombing Alexandria, at which point you, you have to withdraw that you don't have a choice. I mean, it's the same kind of thing as um, the historical campaigns in Greece and then later with the evacuation of Crete. At number two, just shy of 75,000 views, the road to Stalingrad. Although the title, How Operation Barbarossa Bled the Wehrmacht Dry, might have been a better title. This video is rather simple. We look at how the Germans rated their divisions in summer 1941 and spring 1942 in terms of combat effectiveness. As you can see, the German army went from an army that had a majority of its division suited for all operations to an army that was mainly suited for defensive operations, according to their own assessment. Of course, several divisions could be reinforced till summer 1942, but still the difference is staggering. Now the question arises, how could the German army with these numbers still achieve the initial successes of Case Blue? Now before we hit number one, one special mention. Namely a video on economic warfare and PewDiePie with 90,000 views. Now keep in mind this video was released in late March 2017. Since then a few people brought it up again. Because apparently it held up over time. Old versus new media. Note that the terms old and new media are less than ideal, but used for the sake of simplicity here. So simplified, the old media consists of established newspapers, TV, radio, magazines and similar information services, whereas the new media are computer games, social media and similar services. In general, the old media was rather negative or even outright hostile towards the new media, which is probably best visible when it comes to computer games, where the coverage was often biased or even slanderous. Of course, one aspect is the computer games are rather new, but there's another aspect that Total Biscuit pointed out quite a while ago, namely that there's a direct competition, 
Because when you play a computer game, you usually don't watch TV. Or when you have YouTube, you might skip the news program. Computer games offered something the old media couldn't compete with, interactivity. And lately social media added authenticity and other aspects that the old media can't properly compete with. This is one of the reasons why TV and newspapers were always a bit, let's be very diplomatic here, critical about computer games for instance. And finally, number one, World War Management 101 with 100,000 views. This video not only looks at both world wars at once, it gives you a glimpse of the complexity of managing a world war as a country. We look at topics like manpower allocation to the military and industry, food distribution, global logistics and many more aspects that are often ignored. Additionally, I put in a lot of work in the visuals as well. Sadly, it didn't help with the views. The inherent disbalance between production and soldiers in the field became apparent once the first war wasn't over after a few weeks as originally envisioned. Thus, the principal belligerents soon encountered the fundamental problem of economics, the allocation of scarce resources between alternative uses. In other words, there were too many men in the trenches. To give you just one example, from the British coal mining industry about 250,000 men joined the army in the first year of the war. This was about 20% of the total workforce. Now your relationship with coal might be rather distant. But in those days coal was a key resource in many aspects. Even during the second world war, it was still the key fuel. Coal was the main energy source of industrialized societies, the key fuel for transport on land and sea, industry, electricity and gas generation, the making of iron and steel and domestic heating. So imagine 20% less workforce in an industry that provided fuel for trains, ships and the armament industry had a rather significant impact once the war to end all wars didn't end after a few weeks. Hence, the British authorities now attempted to dissuade miners from volunteering. The situation in World War II was similar. Although Germany had plenty of coal, the major bottleneck was the manpower breaking it out of the earth. The mines and machines weren't properly modernized, and since the war effort required the resources to be spent somewhere else, the only way production could be increased was by doing shifts on Sundays, the use of slave labor, and prisoners of war. Nevertheless, the production was insufficient. Thus coal for civilian use was limited after 1941. Well, I hope you learned something from these clips and maybe you want to give the full videos a shot now. A big thank you here to my Patreon and subscribers and supporters that make videos like this possible. Special thanks to my Discord crew for bringing up some of these topics and especially to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thank you for watching and see you next time.